All right, very good. Turn in your Bibles with me, would you please, to the book of Luke, Luke chapter 1. Let me lay some groundwork here this morning, and then we'll preach to you for a few moments today. And uh, we're looking in the Gospel of Luke. It's through the Gospel of Matthew, and then also in the Gospel of Luke that we have much information regarding Christ's birth. In the book of Matthew, Jesus is portrayed as the King of the Jews. And so even his lineage is directed that way to show who he is as a rightful heir to the throne of David. In the Gospel of Luke, in Luke chapter 3, we have the lineage of Christ, and it goes all the way back to Adam, because the Gospel of Luke tells us that he is the Savior for all. We learn this through all the Gospels, but it's really projected here through the Gospel of Luke. Luke, whom the Lord used, the, the Lord's human writing instrument to give us God's Word, was a physician, and so there's tremendous detail. The Gospel of Luke is the longest book in the New Testament, and it's through the detail here that we read just a moment ago in the first five verses that he desired for a fellow by the name of Theophilus to be certain of some things. Notice this in verse 4, please, of Luke chapter 1, that thou mightest know the certainty of of those things wherein thou hast been instructed. I'm glad today that we have the Word of God. I'm glad today that we are taught to believe and to take God's Word to be truth, for it is truth. Luke desired that Theophilus would be grounded in that. Well, that ought to be every one of our desires for others, for our children, for our grandchildren, for those that we would reach for Christ and with the gospel, that they would be grounded, that they would be sound in knowing the certainty of these things. You see, men come along and they try to shake our faith in the Word of God. They try to shake our faith in the miracles of God. They try to shake our faith in the virgin birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. They try to shake our faith in His death, His burial, and His resurrection. But the record is clear and the record is plain and time testifies and truth testifies and eyewitnesses testify of the risen Savior and we rejoice in that today I don't have a problem considering the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ I think it's a good thing to recognize that but I would be very careful not to worship an event not to worship the event but to worship the Christ of the event we try to honor him in both his birth and in his life and in his death, his burial, and his resurrection. But it is such an unbelievable and incredible and awesome thought that God, the creator of all there is, would come and dwell amongst men. That he would walk amongst men. That he would be born in a manger, the lowliest of places. He was born in Bethlehem as prophecy foretold through God's sovereignty when taxation would happen that would require for Mary and Joseph to return back to their hometown they would go to Bethlehem Bethlehem was no booming metropolis Bethlehem at that time was a very much off the beaten path so to speak and was very rustic many people had come to that area because of the taxation and there was no place for them he came to a world that was busy he came to a world that was crowded as the scripture would say, he came unto his own, and his own received him not. And I'm afraid at times today we live in a world that's busy. We live in a world that is crowded by things and by desires. And quite honestly, at times I wonder if people really have room for Jesus. I not fault the innkeeper, or even those surrounding that. It's a tremendous picture. If God had wanted Jesus to be born in a palace, he would have been. If he had wanted him to be born at the top of a mountain, at a pinnacle of all creation for all the world to see, he could have been. But God, in his tender mercies, entered into this world and was born in a manger, a lowly place. Seems to speak to me of this. If Jesus would be born in a manger, then surely, as he promises, he would indwell me. For I, too, am much like a lowly manger. And I'm thankful today for a good and gracious God who loved and gave himself for us, who humbled himself and came to us. And so the first few verses of the book of Luke open up with instruction that we're going to be given an account and that we're to be, uh, have a certainty of this and to be instructed in this and to know these things and to be grounded in them as truth. And then I want you to notice the opening of verse 5. It's very important. There was in the days of Herod. There's much to unpack there in just that simple statement. 
I used this example this morning in the 9 o'clock service. Those of you that have been around in a little while and you remember particular events that have taken place in American history, if I were to say to you, for example, there were in the days of Reagan or there were in the days of Trump or there were in the days of Biden, if there were in the days of Jimmy Carter and some of you go all the way back to Abraham Lincoln, you would recognize the time period by that name. This is the Herod who is called Herod the Great. There are four Herods that are mentioned in the scripture. This is the particular one who was the guy that somewhat got it all started. He was a schemer. He was a murderer. As a matter of fact, Augustus Caesar who knew him and they had had a bond and he was the one who had helped Herod the Great to be in power. He made this statement and it's quoted throughout history. He said that it's better to be Herod's dog than to be his child. Herod is credited with such great things as having 46 members of the Sanhedrin killed in order to maintain his power. He's credited with having his brother-in-law, who he had appointed to be high priest in the temple that he had helped to build, he had his brother-in-law put to death. He was married to 10 women and he had one of his mother-in-laws put to death. He also had one of his own wives and two of his own children put to death. He was power hungry. There was a time of darkness. When you hear that statement, there was in the days of Herod, the first thing is to recognize that it was a time of tremendous darkness. There were those who had lost hope in God. There were those who no doubt would say things like this, has God forgotten his people? If you had looked on at Israel, if you had looked on at where they were at and what they were going through, you too might have wondered, where is this God of Israel? There was a remnant of people like Simeon and like Anna, who would read about later on the Gospel of Luke, who were looking and hoping and waiting and had that promise that they would live to see the Messiah. There were those who longed for the promises of God to be fulfilled. But many people had gone about their life. They'd gone about the busyness of life. Those like Herod had gone about to establish their own throne. Herod was such a class act when he heard that the promised one that his people had been looking for, their Messiah, had come. And we read of this in the Gospel of Matthew when he heard from the wise men who'd come from the east. He was so excited about this Messiah being born that he wanted to kill anybody who would fit that category and be in that age group. These were the days that they lived in. And yet in those days there was a man by the name of Zacharias and there was a lady by the name of Elizabeth his wife. They were devout people. They had a good testimony in their generation. They were believers in God. They were following God and they were going about the operation of life. Very much in many ways we too are living in days like Herod. We too are living in days where people say, where is this Savior that has promised his return? There is when there will be in the last day mockers who will question and wonder what's happening. Where is God and why does God uh, delay in his coming. Where are these future plans that God has for the earth? Please do not dismiss the fact that God is long suffering. Please do not dismiss this fact that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. If you're here today on planet earth and you're breathing and taking in air and you do not know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, God for you waits today. He would have you today to come to his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, in faith, believing that he lived and died and rose again for your sins. We sing today of the angels and their announcement of Christ's birth. The world is warm and fuzzy today, thinking of a babe in a manger. But I point to you today, to the right hand of the Father, where Jesus Christ, that babe, God who entered in and dwelt amongst men in flesh, he stands today and sits today on our behalf, but armed and ready for the next event. I wish today that you would know Christ as your Savior. If thinking of Christ and His birth warms your heart, then let me tell you something. There's something far greater than that. And that's the gift of salvation that God has provided to you. And it's the warmth of the Spirit of God that lives within the believer that causes our spirit to cry out to God and to recognize that relationship that we have to Him. Zacharias and Elizabeth... Uh, going about their tasks. But something special has happened in Zechariah's life. He is a priest. And it's fallen upon the group of priests that he's a part of to do something that that group would do two times a year for a week at a time. And that is to do the work of the Lord in the temple. What would happen in the midst of that is one priest would be picked to go and to be able to go into a place called the holy place of God and to offer up incense. This is quite the event. 
Many priests would live and die and never have this opportunity. If they were ever given this opportunity, they were only allowed to do it one time. You see, God did not want coming into his house, coming into his temple, coming into those things which belonged to him. First, he wanted to show that there was a separation between God and man. He wanted to show that it was an awesome thing to approach him. We remember from our study just a couple of weeks ago that inside of the tabernacle and then inside of the temple there were two rooms. They were special rooms. They were sacred rooms. The first room was the holy place. Beyond the holy place was the holy of holies. In the holy of holies, for example, in the tabernacle is where the ark of the covenant had been placed. It was there that God came in what's called the Shekinah glory and God's very presence filled the holy of holies. But then in that outer room, there were daily things that would be cared for. In that outer room, the holy place, there was a golden candlestick. There was also a table of showbread. And then there was an altar. And on that altar, incense would be offered. A sweet smell would go up to heaven. That was an expression to them, to all of Israel, that there was a, a fragrance being offered to God in their prayers and in their service to Him. It was a type of Christ, that the Lord Jesus Christ is that sweet fragrance before God on our behalf. And so, two times a day, a priest, special occasion, chosen, one time in his lifetime, would go in of the morning and of the evening, and he would offer on that altar incense that would be offered up to God. This has fallen now on Zacharias to do this. This is a special day. How many of you have ever had special days in your life? How many of you have ever had a moment in your life or something where you felt like everybody was watching you? This is what Zacharias had. Verse 10 says, And the whole multitude of the people were praying without at the time of this offering of incense. So get the picture. Zacharias has come into Jerusalem to be a part of his group taking care of the work of the temple. The lot has been chosen. And Zacharias now will do something that perhaps even as a boy he heard about. and Something that as he was in training he looked forward to. And now is his day. He'll enter in. He'll bring before God that offering and offer on that altar of incense. And the Bible goes into great detail here of telling us the times, the times of Herod. It tells us the order of Zechariah. It tells us that this is his chance. And while he's there in verse 11, the Bible says, And there appeared unto him an angel of the Lord, standing on the right side of the altar of incense. Now listen. This is his first time in this spot. Do you think maybe he wondered, does everybody get this? What's going on here? Remember now, the multitude is without and they're praying. They're watching him go in as a picture and a type of all those things we touched on of God and prayers being offered up to God for the people and that sweet smell of those prayers going up. And now Zacharias is in there. The Bible says that he's well stricken in years that his wife Elizabeth is past that age of having a child. It gives us those descriptive terms. And there he is performing this and this angel appears. The angel at this point does not give his name. We find out later that this is the angel Gabriel. The angel who stands in the presence of the Lord. The angel Gabriel who would bring the message to Daniel of prophecy. The angel Gabriel who we'll read of here in a moment. Who will bring to Mary the good news of what God has in store for her life. And this angel says to Zacharias in verse 13. Fear not for thy prayer is heard. What would his prayer have been? I think first and foremost would have been a prayer that the Redeemer or the Messiah would come. This would have been a common thing for a priest to ask, that God would come, that God would send that promised one, the one that they were looking to, that that Messiah, that anointed one, that chosen one, who would come and help the people of God, who would come and lead the people of God, that he would come, that the Redeemer would come. And then I suspect there was also in Zacharias' heart, and had been for many years, a prayer for a child. I don't know that on that day he was asking because perhaps as he looked at his body, he would have said, I'm old and well stricken in years. I'm beyond that. How many of you rec can understand that? How many of you, if you heard right now, you're going to have a child would shriek in terror? <laughs> yes, I agree. I understand. Zacharias is there. And the angel says to him, hey, fear not. Your prayer has been heard. Your prayer has been heard. Not only is the Redeemer coming, not only is the Messiah coming, but you're going to have a child. That would have probably scared me even more. 
Look what it says here. Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard, and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. The Lord's very clear, isn't he, in telling not only are you going to have a child, but by whom you're going to have a child. Well, probably, naturally speaking, Zacharias would have thought, I'm going to have a child by whom? Because Elizabeth isn't going to have a child. How's this going to happen? He said, you're going to have a child, and it's going to come through Elizabeth, whom the Bible described as being what? Barren. You see, the Lord had in all of his plans, didn't he? In all of his purposes, the right time, the right couple, the right place for his will to be continued on. Friend, we don't always know what God is doing, but we can trust him. Zacharias hears this news. Verse 14, and for time's sake, and thou shalt have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth. Speaking of John, and there's a description in verse 15 of who he would be. There's a description of his ministry in verse 16, how God would use him. And then in verse 17, consider the last statement, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. It was mentioned as well in verse 17 that he would come in the spirit is described in power of Elias, which prophets had foretold that one would come who would be the forerunner of Jesus Christ. You're going to call him John. The name John means that Jehovah is a gracious giver. I want the announcement of his birth. I want the meaning of his name to be exclaimed throughout that Jehovah is a gracious giver. Zechariah has the wrong response. Verse 18 and Zechariah said unto the angel, Whereby shall I know this? For I am an old man, and my wife well stricken in years. In other words, how is this going to happen to me, given the fact that I am past the age, as is my wife? Wrong answer. You got an angel talking to you. You know what you should do in the event an angel should talk to you? Check yourself in. Because God doesn't operate that way now, right? We have a better witness. We have a more sure witness. We have the, the testimony of the risen Savior, right? But in God's economy, he used angels to speak to people here. Zechariah said, how is this going to happen to me? Don't you know who I am? Hold on a second. You're the priest. You're a leader of the people of God, and you question God's time. Don't you know from your heritage, is there anything too hard for the Lord? Well, this helps me to know that we don't always have the right response to what God's doing in our life, do we? How many of us could testify that there have been things that have happened in our life that we were scratching our head about and wondering, what in the world are you doing, God? Maybe it was sickness or illness or hurt or pain or maybe as you look back over your life, you see, and through the course of life, situations that have transpired, you wonder, God, what were you thinking? God, what were you doing? Again, I don't always know what he's doing, but I know that I can trust him. And I see here unfold in their life all those years of longing for a child and perhaps being around others as they were having children and wondering for Elizabeth, why is my womb barren? Why has the Lord closed my womb? But God had a plan in that. God said, you're going to have this son and he will come in such power and he'll be used in such a way and he will have, I believe, perhaps one of the greatest ministries that a person can have. It will be John the Baptist who will look one day and proclaim for all the world to hear, Behold, the Lamb of God. It will be John the Baptist who will say about Christ, He must increase and I must decrease. What a ministry their son would have. Zacharias was questioning. And the angel answering said unto him, I am Gabriel that stand in the presence of God. And I'm sent to speak unto thee and to show thee these glad tidings. Notice verse 20. And behold, thou shalt be dumb and not able to speak until that day that these things shall be performed because thou believest not my words which shall be fulfilled in their season. Man, when you don't know what God is doing, don't question it. Just be quiet and trust him. God hit the mute button. Wouldn't that be wonderful to have later on this week? Do you have relatives that you'd like to hit the mute button on? Wouldn't that be fantastic? They have them. They're called shock collars. <laughs> you're going to be dumb and you're not going to be able to speak because you, you opened your mouth when you shouldn't have and you questioned what the Lord was doing. And so we know very quickly the people waited outside. Remember that crowd had gathered. That people waited for Zacharias and marveled that he had tarried so long in the temple. You know that Zacharias had one of those cousins, right? 
who looked at somebody else in the family and said, it's just like him. What did he do now? What did he mess up? Did he knock the candlestick over? Did he knock the bread off the table? What's taking him so long? Get out of here. And there comes Zacharias, and when he walks out, the Bible says that the people waited, and then that they marveled and in tearing, and when he came out, he could not speak unto them, and they perceived that he had seen a vision. And he had seen a vision. He went home when his time was up, and he, Elizabeth, came together, and a child came forth by the name of, well, let's look at that together, can we please? Verse 57 of Luke chapter 1. I've got 15 minutes. Actually, I've got all the time I need. That's my gift to you this year. <laughs> now, Elizabeth's full time came that she should be delivered, and she brought forth a son, just like God said. And her neighbors and her cousins heard how the Lord had showed great mercy upon her, and they rejoiced with her. Remember that she hid herself for five months once she found out that she was pregnant. Why did she hide herself for five months? Because of her cousins. She didn't want to hear it from them. You did what? Don't you know how old you are? Are you crazy? Finally, it comes to pass, and all the world knows, right? And everybody gets together. The verse 59, and it came to pass that on the eighth day they came to circumcise the child. We talked about this last week with Joshua leading the children of Israel in. Eight days after the birth of a male child, he would be presented, recognized. That would take place, that rite, that circumcision, which was a picture, an expression of the covenant that God had with Abraham's descendants. A cutting away of the flesh, a consideration for following the Lord. And they're going to name him. And the family said, we're going to call him what? Zacharias, after the name of his what? Father. And his mother answered and said, not so, but he shall be called John. And they, remember now, who are the they? That's their family, that's their cousins. And they said unto her, there is none of thy kindred that is called by this name. And they made signs to his father how he would have him called. Now, time out here. You read past that real quick, and you say, well, you know, what's the big deal? Well, there was family members there that wanted their only child, a son, to have the father's name. That was cultural. That was reasonable. Why would you give him any other name? This is a family name. You want him to be remembered, right? You want this name to be carried on. And Elizabeth said, no, we're going to call him John. But I figured that Zacharias had some relatives involved. And I figure on their way in there, they said, these two have lost their minds. He can't talk anymore. He's so in shock by this thing. and She's lost her mind. And now she's going to name him John. Where did that name come from? What's that all about? His daddy's name is Zacharias. Hey, that's my brother, or that's, that's my uncle, or that's my cousin. Hey, no, 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 that's my son. You're going to give him his dad's name. That's what's right. That's what's appropriate. Elizabeth said, no, his name is John. And so then they went over to Zacharias and said, hey. And he used the first iPad. <laughs> and what did he say? And he asked for a writing table and wrote saying, his name is John. And they what? They marveled all. What in the world is this about? Why would you not name your only child, your son, after yourself? Why would you name him John? But it wasn't. For Zacharias and Elizabeth to name him, God had given him a name. Because John's ministry, friend, was to be a declaration of what? That God is gracious and that God is a gracious giver. Well, the Bible says this, verse 64, And his mouth was opened immediately, and his tongue loosed, and he spake and did what? Praise God. God let him talk again when he recognized God's plan and God's purposes. God said, you've got something to talk about now. That was all introduction. Let me give you the message, could I please? In the Gospel of Luke, there are four things that are referenced as songs. There is uh, the song of Mary, when she hears that she too is a part of God's purposes and God's plan. There's Zechariah's song that we're going to see here in just a moment. There's the angel's song in chapter 2, and there's Simeon's song in chapter 2 as well. Look with me now at something that we've not read just yet. And let me break this down with us very quickly and we'll be done. Thank you so much for listening today and being attentive. I know that you've already had way too much fudge, sugar cookies. How many of you have had ham already? How many of you are having ham today? How many of you are having steaks today at your house? I want to see where I was going. All right. 
very good here. Let's see here what happens. And immediately uh, his tongue loosed, and he spake and praised God, and fear came on all that dwelt round about them. And all these things were noised abroad throughout all the hill country of Judea. And all that heard them laid them up in their hearts, saying, What manner of child shall this be? Meaning of John. And the hand of the Lord was with him. And his father Zacharias was filled with the Holy Ghost and prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited and redeemed his people, and hath raised up an horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since the world began, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all that hate us, to perform the mercy promised to our fathers, and to remember his holy covenant, the oath which he sware to our father Abraham, that he would grant unto us that we being delivered out of the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. And thou, child, shalt be called the prophet of the highest, for thou shalt go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation unto his people by the remission of their sins. Through the tender mercy of God, through the tender mercy of our God, whereby the day spring from on high hath visited us, to give light to them that sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. And the child grew and waxed strong in spirit and was in the deserts till the day of his showing unto Israel. Could we for just a few moments consider this song or these statements that were made? The Bible tells us that Zacharias was moved and was filled with the Holy Ghost and he made statements he expressed some things, and I want you to see them because it's so important. There are some things here that speak of prophecy, and then there are things that speak of practicality. First of all, he recognized the saving purpose for Christ coming into this world. He had come to do something. There's a word that jumps out to us, and that is the word redeem. Redeem. To redeem means to buy back. Jesus came into this earth in order that he might be able to be in a position to redeem us to God. For we need to be purchased by his blood. When Adam and Eve sinned and, and through rebellion, through doubting and having a, a, a moving away from God, sin entered in and with sin came the consequence and with that consequence of sin came death. And Adam and Eve, who had never known fear, became fearful. Adam, who would walk with God at a given point of the day, and they would discuss what Adam had done with creation that God had entrusted to him. After sin entered in, God came to the garden, and Adam was nowhere to be found. Adam! Adam! Hey, Adam, where are you? And Adam and Eve had done something. They had taken leaves, uh, and they had covered themselves. And Adam, who would normally... Run to God and be there very waiting on God to be in the presence of God. Now Adam is fearful because you see sin brought in fear. And now man, with that understanding of who he is, his sinfulness and the awfulness of sin, and recognizing the holiness and the glory of God, Adam said, I hid myself because I didn't want you to find me. I didn't want you to see me. One of the deceptions of the enemies is self-righteousness. To lead man down a path to think that in some way, somehow, we could ever be or clothe ourselves in something that a holy and righteous God would ever accept of us. It's the greatest lie. Only God can clothe us and present us to himself. That redemption was a part of that and God redeeming us and buying us back from the sin that had cost us so much and had cost him our fellowship with him. Zacharias speaks of this redemption he speaks of the strength. The Lord Jesus is referenced in verse 69 as being a horn of salvation. In the Bible, the term horn speaks of strength. It speaks of the fulfilled prophecy that he would come from the house of David. There is a purpose of redemption. There is the purpose for strength. There is the purpose that our enemies would de be defeated. Prophetically, this speaks someday of the enemies of Israel being put down by the Lord Jesus Christ. But this speaks to us also today in that in Christ today our enemies have been defeated. Oh, death, where is thy sting? Hey, grave, where's your victory? Hey, listen, the Bible tells us that we are overcomers, that we're more than conquerors through him. We have the victory. It is ours. 
We don't walk in fear of the enemy. We do not walk in dread of death. For we know that as God's children, we know as those that have been blood washed and blood bought, that there waits for us a better day and a better place. Your perspective is different today if you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. Your world look, your outlook, everything should be different when you consider who He is and what He's done. Our enemies cared for, strength displayed, forgiveness of sins offered, fulfillment of the prophets, a fulfillment of the promise to the fathers, verse 72, a fulfillment of the oath of the covenant that God has extended to us. May I say to you that just as God kept his word to Israel, God keeps his word to us. Every promise in the book is true. You can count on it. Prophecies have been fulfilled. We could spend hours discussing the prophecy that has been fulfilled, that was foretold and has now come to pass. Friend, today you have no reason to doubt God and or to doubt God's plans for the future. If God says it will happen, it will happen. It is just a matter of when it will happen, but we know that it will take place because God has declared it. This morning your heart was sensitive and tender enough perhaps by the invitation of someone or perhaps simply by the Lord drawing you in. If you're here today under the sound of my voice and you do not have the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, I beg you, I plead with you, don't leave today. Don't leave today not knowing Him. Trust Him today. Notice this. Not only do we see the prophecy fulfilled, the purpose explained, but then recognize the practical of this, that he would grant unto us that verse 74, that we being delivered out of the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear. We've been looking at Joshua and the life of Joshua as God brought Israel out of Egypt and then led them across the wilderness, eventually bringing them in. And he brought them in and had for them the promised land that they would be able to do what? Serve him. God wanted them to drive out their enemies so that they could be in a place without fear, so that they could serve him with their whole heart. This is what Christ has done for us. He's made it available to us to serve him without fear. The Bible says that we serve him not with, just without fear, but verse 75, we serve him in holiness and righteousness all the days of, of our life. We serve without fear. We serve in good standing because of Christ. Then I want you to consider that he enables us as well. Look at this statement very quickly regarding the message that John would preach about Christ. To give knowledge of salvation unto his people by the remission of their sins, through the tender mercy of our God. That expression, tender mercy, is seen in other portions of Scripture, and there's a word that's linked to it. It's the word bowels. Bowels of tender mercy. God, at his core, is tender mercy. The Bible tells us that Jesus was moved with compassion, he was moved with compassion because at his core, our God's core is to be merciful and to be tender towards us. There are times when my heart is stirred. There are times when I'm affected in my heart by what I see. Mine eye affects my heart. I see things and it stirs my heart. And that speaks of an action or a moment in my life. But our God's core, who he is, is love. Who he is, is tender mercy. It is only because of God's tender mercies that we are not consumed today. Today, don't miss it. Don't, don't, don't forget this. God who made you has been so merciful and so gracious in our lives. Notice what it says here. Through the tender mercy of our God, whereby the day spring from on high hath what? Visited us. The day spring. That's the dawning. These are the days of Herod. They're days of darkness. There are days of people wondering, has God forgotten us? The day spring, Jesus comes up. And just as you've seen before, the dawning of the day, the dark night, a difficult night. But you go out and something happens every day. What happens? The sun comes up. What is there in that? There's hope. I gave you three statements and I'll let you go. Number one, the Lord Jesus in his coming to us the day spring brings hope to our life. We have hope. I don't know in your life, those that you interact with and those that you're involved with, but as a pastor, there are times when I have spent time with people who have no hope. This is a time of year that exposes, for some people, their lack 
of hope. There are pressures that come. There are expectations that are not fulfilled. There's a, there's a thought process that we have, and at times this time of year, people and their lack of hope is expressed. We have hope. I, I can lay my head down on my pillow at night knowing that the Lord is with me, knowing that the Lord will protect me, knowing that the Lord will provide for me, knowing that the Lord has purpose for me. That's hope. I don't know how you can value that. I don't want purpose. There's no politician that brings that. Only the Prince of Peace brings hope. Where you're able to look at things and look at life and going forward in life and having hope. Hope to face tomorrow. Hope in the midst of crisis. I sat this week with those who are infirmed. I sat with those who have received in their life what could potentially be a death sentence from the world's perspective. And I saw in the face of the people of God, hope. Hope that there's something better coming for God's people. Hope that even in the midst of trial, there's purpose and there's patience with God. And there's something that will unfold in that. Hope! When the angels showed up in Luke chapter 2 and their message that they broadcasted across the skies, the greatest thing of that was this matter of hope that we have now. A hope to face tomorrow. With the entrance of that horizing horizon, with the day star who would come, who had visited us, there is hope. Notice verse 79, to give light to them that sit in darkness. Not only do we have hope, but we have clarity. We have clarity. In Christ we have hope, in Christ we have clarity. What do I mean by that? I, I, I know who I am. I know why I am. I know what it's all about. You know there are people who will spend their lives earning doctorates and earning certificates to hang on their walls and the approval of man with that thirst and that desire to get the answer to that question. Who am I and why am I here? What's it all about? The thinker pondering. And yet I know very clearly who I am. I'm made by God and I'm made in God's image. I know why I am. I'm made to bring glory to Him. I know how I am to do that because of the hope that came through the Lord Jesus Christ. And I know that my life, for whatever years, whatever months, whatever days it may be, I get why I'm here. I'm here for Him. Like John who declared, He must increase and I must decrease. We understand this hope and we understand this clarity. We have purpose today. Purpose. Clarity. Then number three, we see something as well. To give light to them that sit in darkness, verse 79, and in the shadow of death. Isn't it good to have light and clarity in the shadow of death? Isn't it good to know, child of God, that even in the shadow of death, even as death looms around us for God's people, we know that the Good Shepherd will lead us through that valley and lead us into life eternal that He has for us. There is that shadow. But then notice this Last point, and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. Number one, I have hope in Christ. Number two, I have clarity in Christ. Number three, I have direction in Christ. I don't just say to people have hope, but I have truth that brings hope. I don't just say to people have clarity and have purpose, but I bring to them a book that speaks of that purpose and explains that to me. And then we don't just leave them saying, okay, have hope and have clarity. But now we say to them, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. We have direction. Directions. I put something together yesterday, a toy. I've not put anything together in a really long time. And I must confess, I like it even less now than I did before. Maybe you're that super dad. That super guy who loves to sit there for hours and follow the instructions. I am not that guy. I will recognize and I'll admit I'd be glad to pay somebody to put it together next time, right? But I know this. Without directions, what a mess it would be. Aren't we glad today that we have a Lord who came to find that which was lost? Who came to break the chains of an old master to be our new master? To bring about in our life no longer a fear of death? to bring to us forgiveness of sins, to bring to us a relationship with our God that we can be pleasing, to give to us direction and clarity that we can live for Him, to make us holy, to make us righteous, so that I can spend my days not in that fear, and not in that wondering and that questioning, but in hope, in clarity, and with a direction in life. And someday we'll see Him. And the one whose birth and humility we rejoice in today will look at him. And friend, I believe that 
like we can't even imagine, we'll really grasp that hope that we had in life. We'll really grasp, grasp that clarity and that matter of direction in our life and our living. We'll be so pleased that we followed His way for our life. Let's pray. Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. Father, we come to you now and we desire, Lord, that from you, if there would be those today that do not know Christ, that today they would come. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. I'm not going to ask you to move from your seat. I just want to help you right where you're at. If you're here this morning, whether you came on your own or somebody invited you, but if today you would say, Preacher, I believe that Jesus came into this world. I recognize his birth, but I, I don't know why. I didn't really understand why. Why did he come? He came, friend, to live a life, to be sinless, to be able to relate to you, to be touched in all points, that he could be to you the perfect lamb, the perfect sacrifice, so that he could pay for your sins, so that you could be restored to your God. Who is here this morning and say, Preacher, I'm not sure today that if I were to die that heaven would be my home. I do not know for sure if I were to die today that I would go to heaven, but I, I have interest in knowing that. And you'd say, Preacher, please pray for me. I do not know that. I don't know that I'm saved. That's a biblical term. I do not know that I'm saved, that my sins are forgiven, that God has re forgiven me, that I'm in good standing with God. Who would say that, Preacher, today? I don't know for sure that I'm saved. If you're here this morning and you've received the gift of salvation, you know Jesus Christ is your Savior. Would you raise your hand this morning? Would you testify of your salvation? Friend, if you this morning could not raise your hand on that point, we want you to be able to. I'm not looking to make a church member out of you. I'm not looking to make a Baptist out of you. I'm looking to bring you to the Savior, the one who entered into this world to redeem us, to pay for sins, to give us hope, to give us clarity, to bring direction to our life. If you're here this morning, right there at your seat, and you've never trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, from a heart of faith, would you call upon Him, believing that you're a sinner, believing that He's the only one that could save you? Would you trust Him today? When I was a teenage boy, early on in my junior high years, I saw myself as a sinner in need of a Savior. I believed that Jesus lived and died and rose again for me, and I recognized the awfulness of my sin. I saw myself as Adam did in the garden, and I was afraid of God because I knew who he was and I knew the state that I was in. In the heart of faith, I threw myself at the feet of Jesus and I said something like this, Lord, I'm a sinner and I know it. And I know that my sin separates me from you. But I believe, Jesus, that you lived and died and rose again for my sin debt. And I'm trusting you as my Savior, you and you alone, Christ. Somewhat like the gentleman who asked in the book of Acts, what must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. I believed. Just as I have a birth date, December 1st, 1972, I've got a new birth date, November of 1984, when as the scripture says, when Jesus was communicating with someone, you must be born again. On that day, spiritually, I was brought to life. I had been dead, but I was born that day, born again, connected to God. If you're here this morning and say, Preacher, I would like to trust Christ as my Savior right here, right now. Preacher, please pray for me. Would you lift your hand? Preacher, I want to be saved. I want to know Christ as my Savior. Let me ask this question this morning. How many of you have loved ones that you're praying for that they would come to know Christ? Raise your hand, would you please? How many of you will spend time with them here in the next few days? Anyone? Is that you? Would you lift, continue to have your hand raised? Wonderful. Could I ask you today to do something there, maybe at your seat or maybe here at the altar? Would you pray today and ask that the Lord would move upon their hearts, that your testimony would be right, and that you would have opportunity to give to them. Maybe it's just simply to give them a, a gospel track, or maybe you'll have opportunity for gospel witness. Would you pray for them today? Would you pray for your son, your daughter, your grandchildren? Maybe it's a parent, a brother, or a sister. Would you ask the Lord to, to do that? Here in just a moment, I have a young man that's going to follow the Lord in believer's baptism. I'm excited for that. I'm wondering right there at your seat if there's decisions that could be made between you and the Lord. I'm going to ask the pianist to play. The altar will be open for just a moment. If you have something on your heart or someone on your heart or you'd like for someone to help you today with the gospel, we'd be glad to do that. Let's stand on our feet here. Could we please?